Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on um, Chapter 6 of Interaction Design, 4th edition. And Chapter 6 is about interfaces. And this is a pretty long chapter. Uh, I think the longest in the book. And so this is going to be a pretty uh, long lecture. And my intention is to break it up into uh, two videos. Um, and uh, this is the first of those two. Uh, this chapter is um, kind of a primer, and it's kind of encyclopedic. Okay, it doesn't it, it doesn't really purport to tell you everything you'd ever want to know about each of these kinds of interfaces that we're going to talk about. Instead. Um, I think it really promises to give you a good start and it promises to be fairly current in its point of view. You know, the, uh, the nature of these uh, interfaces for digital uh, systems is such that they change as new products are invented and new practices are uh, discovered. And um, so they get dated pretty quickly. And in fact, I looked at this uh, chapter. This is the first time I'm teaching from the fourth edition of this interaction design book. So I, I went back uh, today when I was uh, reviewing for the uh, for the lecture and compared it to uh, the interface is a chapter in the third edition. And they've really done a lot of work. Um, you know, they've updated a lot of the discussion. They've uh, freshened up a number of the the examples. They dumped a couple of categories that are were a little bit uh, older, or perhaps misdirected, and they've added a few more. So a lot of work has gone into this. But like an encyclopedia, this is a place to start, right? And... Uh, in the discussion within the chapters, there's uh, a pretty good references to resources on the research, um, to uh, people who've, uh, say, published a text in the field. There's certainly enough to get you started with just about everything. And um, it's sort of the ideal encyclopedic uh, uh, treatment. So... Uh, as a practitioner, I think you should know about all these kinds of interfaces. And, um, uh, but as you go through your practice, you'll probably be uh, finding your way to a lot more information about each one as you're working with it. The one exception of that could be the web, since we work so intensely with the web. Um, you know, you may already know a lot about uh, web interfaces, and uh, you may, it's sort of hard to avoid the web interface, but the rest of them, um, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay, so off we go. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about different kinds of interface uh, types, and we want to be clear that this is not meant to be an exhaustive classification of interface uh, types, but rather a list of important ones. It's also true that a particular interface might qualify in more than one of these uh, categories. Okay, so what we're trying to do is to orient you and to point you towards uh, the research and other resources uh, without uh, trying to, you know, we're not trying to promote some kind of uh, a taxonomy of interfaces that is absolute. So, and the way that they're organized within the chapter is kind of chronologically, right? So, as, uh, as people have uh, developed um, computer-based interfaces, they began with these uh, command-based ones that we see here. And they, you know, as we get to the end of the chapter, we're talking about things that are evolved recently or evolving as we speak. So uh, that's kind of how they're organized. So a command-based 
um, interfaces are usually textual. Okay, so typically um, uh, the input from the user is uh, typed and the output uh, comes back. Uh, these days it, it comes back on some kind of screen. Uh, in the early days it it was uh, typed out on some kind of paper, a lot of times on uh, teletype roll paper, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the commands that we type in are typically abbreviations for the kind of action that we want the, the system to take. Uh, so for instance, if we wanted to list the files in the current directory, we might type in Linux, we might type ls. Um, some commands can be hardwired to the keyboard. Others can be, it can be assigned to individual keys. Some uh, commands can be a combination of keys like the uh, classic control, alternate, and delete or uh, the control X, uh, control V for uh, cut and paste. Um, in terms of being able to execute them, um, Provided that you remember all the commands uh, and you're a fast uh, typist, they can be pretty efficient, precise, and fast. Uh, they just have a big uh, sort of learning and memory and uh, uh, typing overhead. So for some uh, categories of super users, these are great. Okay, and for others, they're uh, uh, really daunting. So... Uh, we have an example here of a uh, kind of a command line interface. It, it, this is a uh, it, 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 this is a uh, game called uh, Second Life, and uh, typically it has a user interface that's uh, graphical. And uh, what we've done here is we have a a text-based interface uh, so that when we go from screen to screen, uh, these are very popular with uh, uh, people who want to play Second Life who are visually impaired. Um, the There's a text that comes back um, that uh, displays in our screen that could be read to the visually impaired user by a screen reader. And then there's uh, there's a box for uh, typing in text where the where the user can um, type in uh, commands. Now the interesting thing here is that um, this is a uh, this is a command based interface, a textually based interface that's been bolted on to a product that originally, uh, as I recall, only had a graphical user interface. Uh, so it really uh, gets to what some of the power is in command-based interfaces. The fact that they're so textual, um, it can make them perhaps more usable with people who have, say, visual um, impairments than uh, your typical graphical user interface uh, would be. What are some of the research and design issues with uh, the command line interfaces? Um, uh, so the form, the name types, and the structure are some of the key uh, questions. Um, uh, how do you form the names of the commands? Uh, how do you make them most memorable? Uh, consistency is always important with all these interfaces, but it's particularly important here. Um, command line interfaces are popular for web scripting. So another thing that command line interfaces allow uh, uh, in terms of being maybe a second user interface is when we want to not only uh, not only on the web but all kinds of products um, there's all kinds of desktop uh, productivity kinds of products things like uh, 
oh, Photoshop and InDesign and uh, Frame uh, Maker and all those kinds of things where you want to do things in some kind of a batch form. And they typically have a scripting language that uh, allow you to do work in uh, batches. And this is something that's uh, not really possible to do um, using the graphical user interface. <clears throat> Number two, we come to uh, WIMP and GUI. And uh, WIMP is uh, kind of the, uh, is an abbreviation for the features that gave rise to GUI. So um, WIMP stand for Windows, Icons, Menus, and Pointing Device. Uh, and the first of these was the Xerox Star, which came out of uh, Xerox Research Park, if I remember. Um, and uh, this was an er early product that, that had a lot of the, the WIMP or GUI uh, features that we know today. It was a very influential uh, product. So uh, with regard to Windows, um, they can be scrolled and stretched or overlapped or opened or closed and moved around the screen using the mouse. Okay, it's pretty common that we know how those uh, work. Um, icons are used to represent applications, objects, commands, and tools. And they typically activate or open when you click on them. Menus are a very important part of this WIMP and GUI interface. And they offer a list of options that could be scrolled through and selected. But the nice thing about menus is the, the ability to see what the possibilities are before we select from the list of possibilities. And the pointing device, uh, at least in the early days, was a mouse that controls the cursor and uh, typically uh, buttons that allow us to click. Although uh, pointing devices and a lot of our current, um, our current devices, uh, such as uh, uh, touch screens that are on our tablets and our mobile phones, uh, typically um, we can point with uh, touch. Uh, the graphical user interfaces were uh, are the uh, culmination of the WIMP approach, um, but they have some more features that w have been uh, kind of added and they've grown into uh, color, 3D, uh, uh, 3D graphics, sound animation, many types of menus, icons, and windows. Um, new graphical elements like uh, toolbars, uh, dock bars, um, rollovers. The challenge now is to design a GUIs that are best suited for tablet, smartphone, and smartwatch interfaces. And that's to say we've had a long time to, um, to learn uh, useful ways to interact with uh, things that are on a screen, either on our desktop or our laptop, that we do the standard uh, uh, kind of GUI and WIMP uh, things with. But the new challenges are in the devices where we uh, point, uh, like the watch, the phone, and the tablet. Okay, some of those uh, interaction features and idioms um, are still being uh, d discovered and uh, tried and uh, proven or disproven. Uh, windows were invented to overcome physical constraints of a computer display. So we enable more information to be viewed and tasks to be performed because the windows uh, represent layers on the screen and we can uh, quickly switch from layer to layer. Scroll bars within the windows also enable more content to be viewed. 
Um, one of the drawbacks of these uh, capability for multiple windows is that uh, sometimes it can make it, it can be hard to find the window that has the content that you want and the kind of things that we've done to make that more manageable are things like listing of windows, iconizing them, shrinking them, and those kinds of things. So as we have expanded the capabilities of uh, GUI and WIMP, uh, we've had to, we've had to uh, uh, kind of grow uh, the repertoire of interactions that we typically expect to get with them in order to keep up with, in this case, just uh, the numbers and size of windows that we have. So here is an example of the boxy look of the first uh, generation uh, GUIs. So we had uh, uh, check boxes, note boxes, and options as square buttons. Okay, so this is probably, this is kind of early graphical user interface um, widgets. These little controls that we put onto uh, GUI screens, be they buttons or sliders or uh, check boxes or uh, drop down boxes, it, we, refer, it, we refer to them as uh, widgets. And so these are um, some of the early available uh, GUI widgets. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that's hard to do is to get a, a full view of everything you've got going. And Apple has this in their uh, currently called Mac OS in the current release, has the ability to uh, sort of look at all the windows that you have. And there is a user interaction that brings this up and they talked about it in the text. I typically get this when I accidentally hover my hand. I accidentally gesture over the uh, mouse pad on my MacBook Pro and I get this. And then I hit escape and gesture over the mouse pad until it goes away. So for me, this is a nuisance because I, I don't know how to bring it up. Um, and it really isn't part of my uh, mental uh, model. It's not part of, it's not something that I need to maintain my mental uh, model of uh, the interface. Uh, but to others, it's great. Uh, the Safari browser has this uh, panorama window view where you can see uh, a lot of your browser sessions at the same time. And again, I forget how to get this up because I don't use it, okay? So it's a great way to uh, consider a lot of your content at one time. As a, kind of an old school browser user, uh, I don't really use this. But, but I do know people who do, and I do think it's pretty cool. And, and the screen that we just saw, I, I think that's uh, cool too, except when it comes up when I'm not asking for it, or uh, when I didn't mean to ask for it. Uh, one thing that is kind of hard to do in uh, these GUI interfaces is to select an entry from a list. And there are a lot of ways that we do this. Sometimes we do it from a series of menus. Sometimes we do it from a drop-down box. But the problem is with uh, certain things like uh, country names, the list is just so darn long. And... Um, uh, two uh, classic things that are done. One is is to is to list them alphabetically. Another way is to list them in terms of the frequency of use or the expected frequency of use. And then, of course, the compromise there that we see on the screen here is where uh, we've put a handful up top in terms of their expected frequency of use, and then we resort to alphabetic. And typically, we're able to type the first letter and jump ahead in the alphabet to where we are there. 
some of these things actually allow us to keep uh, typing and kind of auto complete them. Uh, so these are this approach is uh, good, but certainly not perfect. Um, and then we just have to ask ourselves, would it be better if we had a prettier, more structured list? And I think for some people it would be. But of course, if you've given up having the most used um, uh, choices up front and you, and you force the user to navigate through the alphabet, however prettily they go through it, um, I think you're probably going to have a worst experience for your average user. At least for me, this is worse than uh, the other alternative. Um, a third alternative is uh, to have uh, some kind of a search interface where you can type into a box and it will bring up a list of uh, candidates uh, dynamically, uh, kind of the behavior that you expect to see from the search box for uh, Google or one of the search engines that is uh, communicating with the, with the search server via Ajax. Um, these, I think, can be an interesting um, kind of compromise and uh, uh, things that, you know, the, the things that I like. If, I, if I'm looking for, say, uh, states in the United States and I type a W and I get all the W states and then I, I just have to pick from that, I, I kind of like that. Um, so that probably would be the, uh, for me, that would be preferred over what we're looking at here. And what's going to happen is that people are, uh, people are very crafty. They'll come up with yet other ways for us to do this. And it's really up to us to be in touch with these uh, uh, features as they emerge and to keep our application um up to date, uh, up to date in terms of the interaction design. Um, what are some of the research and design issues having to do with WIMP and GUI? Well, window management is one. We want to enable the users to move fluidly between windows. And of course, as I can see here on my desk, windows that may be on more than one monitor. Um, we're, uh, there's a lot of work on how to switch attention between windows without getting uh, distracted or disoriented. Um, and the kinds of things that can be helpful are design principles for spacing, grouping, and simplicity. So the next element uh, that we want to talk about is menus. Um, and there are a number of menu interface styles. We've got flat lists, we've got drop downs, we've got pop ups, we have contextual menus, we have expanding ones, ones that scroll and or cascade. So flat menus are good at, at displaying a small number of options at the same time. And uh, they're, they're good when the when the display size is small, something like an iPod. Um, but you have to nest the list of options within each other, requiring several steps in order to get the list with the desired option. And moving through a series of screens can be tedious, and if people are a bit ham-handed like me, lose their place often in these kinds of uh, schemes. Expanding menus... Uh, they enable more options to be shown on a single screen than is possible with a single flat menu. More flexible navigation allowing for a selection of options to be done in the same window. The most popular are the cascading ones. And here's where I, here's where I probably have the worst uh, problems with my ham-handedness. Um, uh, sometimes you have a primary uh, secondary and even uh, tertiary menus and you really have to control your mouse or your pointing well in order to uh, 
bring up the expanding menus without losing your place or losing the menu altogether. So um, for some people that, you know, they're very good at these and uh, I'm getting better, uh, but I'm still, um, I still find that I make a lot of mistakes on these. And of course, I'd be interested in what your experience is. And this is a typical cascading menu, sort of a dated screen. But um, so we begin in the menu system and then we, we just sort of pick in a cascading uh, bunch of choices. And provided that we don't lose our place, uh, these are pretty popular. What about contextual menus? So these provide access to often used commands that make sense in the context of the current uh, test. They appear when the user presses the control key while clicking on an interface element. Or there are some other things that you can do to bring them up. Uh, for instance, clicking on a photo and a website together with holding down the control key results and options, open a new window, save it, blah, blah. It helps to overcome some of the navigation problems associated with cascading menus. Uh, and it's more directly associated with objects on the screen than perhaps cascading menus are. They have the potential to be, at least. Uh, here's a Windows jump list. And um, I'm going to leave Windows jump list to you because I've never really liked or used Windows jump list. So I'm going to leave this for you to explore on your own. Uh, <clears throat> it's on the list of things that I don't want to give airtime to. Um, Research and design issues related to menus. Uh, what are the best names, labels, and phrases to use? Okay. Uh, uh, of course, we want to make sure that they're easily identifiable. They're not confused. Um, they're easy to find compared to their frequency of use. Uh, there's a lot of competing, uh, uh, competing uh, considerations when, when doing this. Uh, placement is critical. Um, quit and save need to be far apart. They need to be far apart if the cost of quitting is high. One of the reasons why we make uh, quitting such a big deal in these user interfaces is um, with a lot of products, when you quit, then you lose your work. But in a lot of modern products, when you start it up again, your work is right there. So uh, the need to protect the user from quitting um, really depends on uh, how much uh, quitting implies uh, an, of an unrecoverable change. Uh, the choice of the menu to use is determined by applications and the type of system. So flat menus are best for displaying a small number of options at one time, expanding Menus are good for showing a large number of options and sub-options and yet further sub-options. Okay, so another aspect of this WIMP interface uh, uh, is icons. And so uh, WIMP and GUI are pretty icon intensive. And it's been the history of this genre uh, that icons have become more important, I think, or, over time. Um, so, for instance, uh, well, uh, I've talked in previous lectures uh, about uh, another text on interaction designed by uh, Cooper uh, called about face and in about face uh, Cooper says that um, the kind of users who like menus are uh, beginners and the kind of users who like command line interfaces are uh, the 
the experts and the kind of users who like uh, uh, toolbar icons are the intermediates. And there are a lot of intermediates. And so uh, toolbar icons are uh, very popular um, because they, um, it's sort of the nature of being a user that if you're a beginner, if you don't become an intermediate soon, you quit. And if you're an expert, if you take a little bit of time off, then you revert to being an intermediate. So it turns out that these icons are just in the sweet spot of um, the continuing user group. So icons are seem to be easier to learn and re remember than commands. They certainly seem to be preferred by intermediates for whatever reason they prefer them. They can be designed to be compact and variably positioned on the screen. They're now pervasive in every interface. They can represent all kinds of objects, uh, tools, applications, operations. Um, we found a way to create these icon objects to represent uh, all kinds of parts of the interaction. Um, what's happened is, is that what we expect of icons has really changed over time. So the first icons we saw in the WIMP interface came from the Xerox star days. Uh, so we began with black and white icons, and so now we've got color, shadowing, photo realistic images, 3D rendering, animation. Um, so Whereas uh, some of these things are just uh, kind of toying with us, uh, some, uh, some others are really creating a richer experience and allowing for distinctions between icons that give us uh, good hints as to um, uh, what they're going to do. So they've uh, created some, in terms of the application, some affordances so that we know we have some kind of expectation on the basis of um, their visual properties. Many are designed to be very detailed and animated, making them uh, attractive and informative. GUIs are now highly inviting, emotionally appealing, and feel alive. So comparing the early GUIs to now, it's always kind of funny to look back. I'll see a screen and I go, that's so 1995, right? Which is uh, now more than 20 years ago. So that's a long time. So that it would look old is not surprising. Uh, <clears throat> so um, when we go to use icons, we need to do them in some kind of a rational way to give the user the best kind of hints about what kind of, what kind of action they're going to get out of clicking on them. And so we, we have a mapping between the representation and the underlying referent. And so what kind of schemes could we use? Well, we could uh, do use similar, analogical, or arbitrary. So in a similar one, we might use a picture of a file to represent a file. In an analogical one, we might use a picture of a pair of scissors to represent the cut action. In an arbitrary one, we might use an X to represent uh, delete. And I'm sure you've all used um, GUI interfaces that used uh, one or all of those, uh, those uh, mappings. Uh, the most effective icons are similar ones, okay? It, 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 to the extent that they're similar, we get similar expectations about them. Um, many operations are actions making it more difficult to represent them. So um, uh, a picture of a static object uh, is in a lot of ways uh, hard to map to some kind of motion uh, or some kind of uh, uh, process. Um, so when we're creating the icons for those, we use a combination of objects and symbols that capture the salient part of an action. 
Uh, here are some of the early icons. So this is uh, a set from the early 90s. Uh, what do we think they mean and why are they so bad? Well, uh, hmm. Uh, they're very pixelated. Uh, they're black and white. Um, a lot of the the things that they try to represent are um, are very. They're trying to represent them directly, but in a lot of ways, they're they're kind of old school. If you look on the bottom row, the not the last one on the right, but the next to last one. It's play. Well, it looks like a record player from before I was born, and I'm probably older than you are by a considerable distance. This is a, kind of a record player a la Thomas Edison. So some of these uh, realistic icons uh, can date quite quickly, and even, uh, e even the window and exit up on item A, um, I'm sure that at the time that, that those were uh, contemporary looking windows and exit signs, but today they look dated. Right? Uh, here on slide 25, we've got uh, a more contemporary set of icons, uh, most of which are all of which are from Mac OS. Uh, yeah, these are the aqua icons for the Mac. Uh, they're still in use now, even under uh, Mac OS uh, Sierra. So the top row of icons have been designed for user application and the bottom rows for utility applications. So if you look at the top row, they're more three-dimensional. Um, they're, they're kind of tilted a bit. They're kind of angled a bit. Uh, they have almost a reverse italic kind of style. And they're in color. And if you look at the utility ones on the bottom, they're less three-dimensional. They're black and white. And they're head-on. They don't seem to have the, the, as much of a three-dimensional or a tilted kind of a look. And those are meant to give us the idea, oh, this is an application. This is a utility. Now, I've got to tell you that I, as a user, uh, never even perceived that difference, right? So the question is, do you perceive it on some kind of a lower level? I, I, I maybe, maybe the actions I take in my searching for icons take this into consideration. I don't even know it. But it certainly wasn't something I was conscious of. Uh, here on slide 26, simple flat 2D icons. Uh, these are... Um, these are icons that we see more of on lower resolution uh, devices like lower resolution smartphones. As the smartphones have got higher resolution displays, we've seen the icons become uh, more complex um, like the ones that we saw on the preceding screen. So the the difference in um, resolutions on these two kinds of uh, uh, devices is really uh, k kind of shrinking and the expectations for icon are kind of merging. Um, so we had an activity in the chapter that we're not going to do now, but this is one where we sketch some simple icons and we uh, try to come up with icons for turn 90 degrees sideways, auto enhance the, the image, fix red eye, crop the image. Um, and the fact is that to a certain extent with icons, you can make them um, kind of tell a story from real life. You can try to give, you can try to show something that would be involved in the activity and even uh, create a photo realistic image. But there are a lot of, especially activity-oriented uh, icons that are going to have to be um, sort of idiomatic. And um, you can, when you design the icon, you can maybe put a couple things to 
to give hints. For instance, for fix the red eye, perhaps we could have a red eye. Uh, for cropping the image, we typically see that those kind of physical cropping tools that people used to use to crop photos. Um, so that's the place where you can uh, you try you know to imitate what people use in real life. But uh, is there a real life image for auto enhancing an image? Well, not really. The you know there's no non digital auto enhance capability okay so there's nothing from the real world the non-digital world the analog world um, that means auto enhance and so you're basically on your own and you want to make these things attractive and uh, consistent and um, we want them to give as big of a hint as they possibly can uh, to jog the memory or to uh, peak the imagination such that people can find their way to them. Uh, so uh, here, slide 28, we're talking about the basic edit icons on an iPhone. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to remember the discussion for the text, I think we were talking about photo editing. And the funny thing for me is I'd never do photo editing on a, uh, on an iPhone. It's just, you know, I just wouldn't do it. I'm not the kind of photo. I'm enough of a, I'm enough of a perfectionist that I, I would find a, a desktop to do it on or a, a laptop to do it on. But, um, so the idea here was, uh, was to look at, a set of icons, say, from the iPhone, and uh, and see how how they are, and compare them to whether they're better or worse, or or kind of equal to the icons that you came up with uh, for the exercise that we just did. Um, generally, I would say that icons have gotten good enough, especially the Apple icons, uh, that um, I think you have to be a pretty good icon designer to beat them, right? I really like their style, and they have a style guide for icons that suggests uh, how to create icons that are compatible with their uh, milieu, and um, uh, the vendors uh, see, uh, who are using their tools seem to do a pretty good job, and so we're generally pretty happy, I think. Well, what are the research and design issues with regard to icons? Uh, so there's a wealth of resources now, so you don't, not, you don't have to draw or invent new icons from scratch. Thank the Lord. So there are guidelines and style guides and icon builders and libraries. Uh, there are text labels that can be used alongside icons to help identification for small icon sets. For large icon sets, um, we use rollovers such that you roll over the icon and you see uh, what the text associated with it is which of course works well for a mouse interface, but not so well for a touch interface. Let's talk about multimedia. So multimedia um, has been an exciting term for a number of years. And what's interesting is there's a lot of overlap between this and web. And what is interesting for me is um, a lot of the experiences that we have on the web these days are multimedia experiences. And so the distinction between these has really begun to blur a lot. But multimedia traditionally combines different media within a single interface with various forms of interactivity. So graphics, text, video, sound, and animations. Sounds like HTML5. Users click on links in an image or text. Um, 
you go to another part of the program, something plays, um, maybe you return to somewhere where you came from. So navigation or local behavior. So here is a, uh, a BioBlast multimedia learning environment and we can click on things and we're going to have uh, a multimedia experience this looks so 1990s to me like i'm I, I when i look at this i go i hope i didn't pay a lot of money for this because this looks like something that i would have bought for my kids when the kids were little and it would have been just what we would have paid about 50 bucks for uh, now, I'm hoping this is open source because this is not looking appealing to me. Pros and cons of multimedia. It facilitates rapid access to multiple representations of uh, related information. It can provide better ways of presenting information than any one medium alone. It can enable easier learning, better understanding, more engagement, and more pleasure. It can encourage users to explore different parts of a game or story. Um, the drawback is that there's a tendency of people to, to uh, kind of skim the cream off of these things. People tend to prefer one medium or other. So there's a tendency if they're video inclined to click on the videos, if they're audio inclined or animation inclined to go for them. Um, one of the recommendations in the text is if you're trying to set up a learning experience and you want them to really visit all the media, um, then to control the application is such that you need to visit things or a preponderance of them in order to continue to go through to keep uh, people from, say, just uh, skimming off your uh, videos in a world where you don't think that's an appropriate learning experience. Research and design issues. Uh, how to design multimedia to help users explore, keep track of, and integrate the multiple representation. Uh, provide hands-on interactivities and simulations that the user has to complete to solve a task. Uh, use dyna-linking where information depicted in one of the windows explicitly changes in relation to what happens in another one. And we have a reference there to the uh, to the SCAFE and Rogers research on same. I've always liked these uh, dyna-linked things uh, because you know, you interact with one object on the screen and then it's connected to some some other object. It, it just seems to be like a really high, it seems to be a, like a high level of interaction. It's something that I really admire. Um, so that I find that very engaging as a user. I guess that's what I'm saying in my own uh, humble way. Uh, several guidelines uh, that recommend how to combine multimedia for different kinds of tasks. And again, um, it, there's the question about how controlling you want to be. Um, most of the multimedia things that I get stuck doing are uh, training in order to uh, prove that I went through training. So each of the public universities where I teach has uh, training for ethics. They've got training for um, uh, diversity. They've got training for uh, Title IX. And they pretty much want to know that you've explored all the content. So their, their scenarios are pretty controlling. Um, and because of that, not so much fun. But I don't think they set out to make them fun. I guess they wanted to make them as fun as they could, but the fact that you're so limited in how you're able to navigate them is is always kind of a turnoff for me. Ah, now we're up to virtual reality. 
So virtual reality, we all have, I think, a pretty good idea of what those kinds of interfaces are like. Um, they include a computer-generated graphics simulation, and it's presented in a way to provide the illusion of participation in a synthetic environment rather than external observation of such an environment. So you're really there, okay? Um, the text makes, I think, a really good uh, distinction between virtual reality applications where you're experiencing it in, in the first person, so you don't typically see yourself or parts of your body, just things around you as you navigate, or uh, third-party interfaces where um, you're kind of uh, following along behind and above the actor that you're controlling. Um, you know, they each have their, uh, they each have their value. And even some applications allow you to switch from, uh, uh, from first person to third person. But I think uh, we would all agree, to the extent that we've had some experience with them, that they really can create some really engaging user experiences. And in particular, a thing that they do very well um, is the ability to make things seem three-dimensional. And, and, that, and that gives them a lot of their realism. Uh, pros and cons. Um, the question is, how, how close should the fidelity be between the objects in our environment be to the objects in the real world? Should they be photorealistic? Um, should they be uh, kind of abstracted? Okay. Um, quite a bit of research done on when you might prefer one over the other. Um, in some cases, uh, um, beginners liking things to be more realistic and maybe uh, experts liking things to be more abstracted. Um, in other cases where it's a game experience, uh, apparently both beginners and experts liking things to be uh, kind of uber photorealistic. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. And here's a bullet that talks about the, the first and third person points of view. And um, at any given time, you're going to be experiencing one or the other. And some applications allow you to switch, which is pretty cool. Um, the, uh, the displays that we mount on the head are sometimes uncomfortable to wear. Um, they can sometimes cause some of the users to become motion sick or disoriented. So those are uh, drawbacks. Some r research and design issues. Um, much of the research is on how to design safe and realistic VRs to facilitate training. So, you know, where's the real uh, payback? Things like flight simulators. Uh, flight simulators create a lot of value because uh, pilots or uh, pilot students can get a lot of experience that uh, is pretty, uh, translates into the real world uh, uh, skill uh, without a lot of danger. So that's terrific. And uh, they're having a lot of uh, success in using these realistic simulations to help people over become, overcome phobias. Things like uh, being close to spiders or talking in public. Uh, so these are uh, desensitization schemes without having to expose people to real spiders or without having to get some kind of a practice audience to come in and listen to your subject. Design issues, how best to navigate through them. Uh, we already talked about the first versus the third person. How to control interactions and movements. Um, 
um, uh, again, uh, uh, in the first person, your movements and interactions are all uh, things that you don't see other than your view changing, right? Whereas in the third person, uh, it, it's probably going to change your view and you're going to see those things actually move. Uh, how best interact with information? Uh, so how are we going to interact with the with the um, uh, with the virtual experience? Are we going to use keypads, keyboards, pointing, joysticks, uh, buttons, gestures, all kinds of things? Um, and there's research going on into and design issues of how realistic does the experience have to be to create the sense of presence that you're looking for. Um, it's probably true that the with uh, with respect to a lot of these things, the more realistic that you try to make them be the more they're going to kind of age over time because uh, people just seem to be able to make things more and more realistic over time. So if you're trying for the realistic, you're going to, your product's going to age and you're probably going to have to update it quite often. On the other hand, if you're trying for a more kind of abstracted experience, uh, you might have a product with somewhat of a longer life, although perhaps not as engaging. So one of the activities that they've invited us to do in the chapter is to take the game Snake and to, uh, to, to see it on more than one platform and to imagine it on others. Now, there are some games that are so realism-oriented that if you you uh, try to port them to a device with say limited uh, displays, that it kind of ruins the game. And there are others in which it really doesn't. And this uh, Snake is a game that the authors feel uh, has the possibility of being an engaging game on a wide range of platforms. So there's a, a really interesting activity where we we see some of what they suggest, and we're to uh, we're to go exploring on some of this on our own in order to uh, think about what this experience would be like on different platforms. Okay. Our next uh, category is information visualization and dashboards. And um, uh, what's kind of funny to me is this, this kind of goes back, it goes back to the, uh, the talk of the, the comment I made about multimedia being hard to distinguish from the web. And information visualization um, and dashboards are um, certainly have a meaning in terms of interaction design, and we're going to talk about the content. But I think what happens over time is that the expectations for these things just kind of get incorporated into the normal level of expectations of products such that um, what's What's a visualization uh, today is just a normal uh, visual interface uh, tomorrow. And uh, uh, the same to some extent with the dashboard. So um, uh, I do think that, that this is uh, a real area. and I'll talk about it. Uh, so we're talking about computer-generated interactive graphics of complex data. Uh, we want to be able to amplify human cognition, enabling users to see patterns, trends, and anomalies in the visualization. The aim is to enhance uh, discovery, decision making, and the explanation of the phenomena 
Techniques include 3D maps that can be zoomed in and out and which uh, present the data via webs, trees, the clusters, scatter plots, and interconnected nodes. And probably the best uh, two examples of this for me come from television. Uh, during elections, typically the election uh, coverage has at least one person who stands in front of a magic screen or screens and they go from visualization to visualization. It can really show some some uh, powerful uh, graphics to help uh, understand um, the uh, voting data. Um, the other places where we see these are on uh, sort of the CSI shows. Um, you'll see where they're uh, trying to search through data on maybe the location of crimes or uh, the possible uh, crime scene locations. And, and they'll bring up uh, maps and they'll project things. And uh, most of it's right out of Hollywood, but it's the kind of stuff we're talking about here. And it can get pretty exciting. I think the two most exciting versions of it uh, are things that I've seen on TV rather than things that then I've actually uh, created myself. But that might not be true for you. Uh, so we show screenshots of data updated over periods of time to be read at a glance uh, in a dashboard. They're usually non-interactive. So they usually are giving us the status of a system or, or uh, something um, in a point in time. And some of the things we're looking at might be immediate. Some might be kind of average over the last however. Some of the things might be totals, um, those kinds of things. And the name of uh, dashboard really comes from the dashboard of a car and the kind of instruments that we expect to see there, which we can, at a glance, um, sort of understand the status of the car. So hence uh, the term uh, dashboard uh, coming over to our line of work. So we need to provide digestible and legible information for the users. Uh, we want to design its spatial layouts so it's intuitive to read when we're first looking at it. Uh, and we should uh, direct the user's attention to anomalies or unexpected uh, deviations. And again, you go back to the, you know, the car. We have uh, probably a couple of things that we need to monitor all the time, like the speed, right? And if we're uh, driving a manual shift, maybe we want to keep our eyes on uh, the engine RPMs when we're doing our uh, shifting. Although a lot of us do it by sound, I think. Um, and, um, and then we have a whole bunch of things that we need to monitor for anomalies. So uh, has the coolant gotten too hot? Um, do we have a tire that's gone flat? Um, do we have a headlight that's out? Uh, are we out of windshield washer fluid? All those kinds of things. So some some combination of things that we want to be kind of monitoring the current status of and maybe adjusting our behavior. And then some other things that are kind of showstoppers that we want to make sure are going to catch our attention. So uh, those same kind of uh, design principles that work for car dashboards uh, work for these uh, dashboards for other activities. Um, we're going to compare two dashboards here. Here's one from a British Airways Frequent Flyer Club. And this one shows what the mile, miles flown, the number of weeks you've been in the air, the cities visited, the countries that you visited. And with the miles that you've done, how much of a distance to the moon do you have? And uh, a uh, trip to the moon, something like 240,000 miles or 244,000 miles, something like that. So what you've flown so far this year, I would assume 99.1% uh, of the way to the moon. 
Now, uh, I think if you've only been in the air for three weeks and you've gotten that many miles, you've probably been on some very long flights. Compare that with uh, a dashboard here uh, from the uh, British Airways Frequent Flyer Club that shows how much a member has flown since joining them. Oh, I'm sorry, that was that. And this, this one we're looking at is uh, a dashboard from London City that provides various information feeds, which is easier to read and most informative. And uh, the authors think that the British Airways is better. And I think so too. Um, uh, you just have to really think about what you like about a good car dashboard. And certainly a good car dashboard um, gives a lot of prominence to things that you need to monitor all the time. And things that you don't need to monitor as often are, are not catching so much attention. In fact, a lot of things on car dashboards are hidden until they go critical. And here, uh, I just think on the London one, we've got too much competing for our attention. Whereas uh, if we go back to uh, uh, British Airways, uh, we've got what, one, two, three, four, five things competing for our, our attention with a little bit of visual help. Uh, I don't think that's bad. That's more like what I can track when I'm driving a car. Whereas uh, the London one, it's all interesting information, but uh, for something that I might call a dashboard, uh, it looks a little overbearing. There's too much here for me to call it a dashboard. I might call this more appropriately, appropriately a portal. You know, it's a way to look at all the things that you might be interested in. And perhaps there's enough to catch my attention to click on one and then to drill down and then to see just that. But I don't think I would, in my mind, I would not show this off as a dashboard. Research and design issues for dashboards. Uh, whether we want to use any animation or interactivity. The two that we just saw there, uh, uh, certainly the British Airways wasn't using animation. There might have been some things on the London one that would change. So um, maybe the London one has some amount of animation and interactivity and the British Airways uh, not. Uh, how do you code things like uh, color and text? Uh, are things going to be 2D or 3D? How are you going to navigate? Are you going to zoom or pan? What kinds and how much information to provide? Uh, are you going to use rollovers or tables for text? Just how busy the thing is. You know, that London thing is just way too busy for me. Uh, and what kind of a navigational metaphor to use? Well, we've worked our way up to the web. A lot of stuff to say about the web. Uh, so the web's going to be the last uh, topic that we're going to have in part one. So, uh, the history of the web. So, early websites were largely text-based, providing mostly uh, hypertext with hyperlinks. The concern was how best to structure the information to enable users to navigate and access it easily and quickly. Nowadays, more emphasis on making pages distinctive, striking, and pleasurable. We need to think of how to design information for multi-platforms, keyboards, or touch. Okay, so uh, uh, it's not uncommon for us to design web applications that uh, are responsive and um, are able to sense what kind of device they're on and uh, control their layout and their styling on the basis of what kind of device they're on. Um, typical responsive web design. 
what about user verse, usability versus attractiveness? Okay, do we want a vanilla or a multi-flavor design? Um, do we want to make sure that things are easy to find uh, versus an aesthetic and enjoyable experience? Uh, web designers are sometimes thinking of great literature. Um, users are thinking of using the web like a billboard that's going by at 60 miles an hour. So uh, we want to make sure that we're designing the experience, we're designing for the experience to promote the experience the user realistically is going to have in their workplace, in their home, wherever they are, and they're trying to interact with our web application. We want to make sure that we are realistically matching the interface to their mm, circumstances and their sensibilities. Now, we have a lot of stuff that we get in the web these days that is, I think, pretty intrusive and offensive. And this has to do with uh, the web finding a way to pay for itself. And it also has to, way with, has to do with uh, people trying to uh, rip us off to a certain extent. Uh, so web advertising, the intended web advertising, is often intrusive and pervasive. Then on top of that, we have some people who try to piggyback on web advertising and get free advertising by, uh, by using malware that gives us even more of this experience. Uh, so we have things that are popping up, things that are flashing, aggressive, persistent, annoying. Um, they often need some kind of action from us to get rid of them. Um, the really interesting thing for me is that I really, uh, I, 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 I have had to say to myself that I don't care what I'm clicking on. This happens to me on my uh, my iPad and my iPhone most often. And I'm going, say I'm going through Facebook and I see an article and I click on it and I immediately get a pop-up. And it might be some kind of article that I'm really interested in. But first of all, the more kind of ad uh, garbage you get, the less reliable the, the, uh, um, the news uh, source uh, typically is. Although you can go to a Washington Post, uh, to a New York Times, and get a nice kind of quality ad to pop up in front of you that you have to clear. But I'll tolerate that from a Washington Post or a New York Times. But if I click on some uh, progressives are us or uh, the conservative way and stuff starts to wander around my screen, I always hit the back button. I don't care what you're trying to, what information you're trying to convey. If you piss me off, I'm gone. Uh, and I, I think that's true for a lot of us. So I, I don't know that it really gets them every, everything they're looking for. There's a lot of pain that's inflicted uh, with no with no real uh, value to the inflictor. Because uh, for many of us, as soon as they create the pain, we disengage. Um, I think that the I think the alternative is to uh, is to give enough opportunities for people to engage with your content um, uh, without uh, taking over the experience. You know, we've been reading newspapers and we've been going to, and magazines, and we've been going to movies and watching TV. And we sort of have an idea about how, uh, how intrusive things can be. And uh, a lot of the web experience really exceeds that. And for the most part, I think people are just simply turning it off. I mean, they, they're either backing up, they're turning it off, or they're certainly not uh, clicking through and go, oh, let me buy this thing that just made my life a misery. So I, th I think the alternative is, is to dial it down and, and get, um, 
get people attracted to your advertising who are likely to buy. You know, people who are likely to buy like to see advertising for things that they like to buy, right? The other people you're just inflicting pain on. Research and design issues. Uh, we need to consider how best to design, present, and structure information and system behavior. Well, it's true just about in all these, all these uh, interfaces. Uh, content and navigation are central. Um, one of the researchers, Veen et al., and their research they did in uh, 2001, came up with three design principles to consider on the web. Where am I? So keeping the user oriented. Where can I go? Having the navigation be obvious. And what's here? Having the content that's here be kind of easy to recognize and to engage with. Um, there's a good discussion in the text about how um, some, some websites that are advertising based, like uh, clothing, uh, clothing manufacturers like Levi's or uh, uh, Nike, that to a certain extent that um, you'll see that these uh, designers seem to break with this, where am I, where can I go, what's here necessity in order to create a really kind of entertainment oriented experience more like an advertisement, more like a TV experience. And to the extent that they really capture your attention and take you on, uh, you know, take you into their movie or take you into their interactive experience, um, even though they might not be paying um, religious attentions to these uh, three principles by Veen, in some genres, they seem to be able to pull this off. And I think it has to do with how willing you are to be kind of entertained as compared to how much you just want to surf to find the information that you want and you want to get out of there. I know sometimes I'm looking for products and I'll come to one of these kind of entertaining product sites. And it's just like, how do I click on the thing that I just get to the list of the products? <laughs> Don't entertain me, you know, so... Uh, it depends on your audience and perhaps their uh, frame of mind. Uh, so there was an activity that they had us do, they suggested to us, where we looked at uh, some of these uh, kinds of websites that perhaps don't pay attention to all the rules. And they had us look at Nike and perhaps one other apparel kind of website. And... Uh, you know, really think about, do you stick with the basic uh, principles or do you go beyond that? And of course, it's a risk that you're taking, but potentially there's some substantial payback, like brand loyalty and or excitement about the, the products. So this is a great place to break. So I'm going to take a break. Hopefully you'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll come to part two of chapter six. So I'll say bye until then. Bye-bye.